Allah the Exalted says in the Quran, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً And amongst his signs is that he created for you from within yourselves wives so that you find tranquility with them and he made between you affection and mercy what a beautiful picture drawn for the marital life as it should be in islam beautiful indeed Love, affection, mercy, tranquility. This is how a man and his wife should lead their lives according to the teachings of Islam. Unfortunately, this was not quite the case before the advent of Islam. See, before the advent of Islam, the wife was demeaned and degraded. A wife was like a commodity for the husband. She shouldered the responsibility of everything. And she had no rights in anything. She was the one responsible to raise the children, clean the house, cook, bring water from a well or from a spring, go bring the wood to cook or to heat the house, warm up the house. She was the one in charge or responsible rather to uh, make clothes, mats, weave tents, everything. And in return, she had no rights. The Arabs used to consider the woman as a piece of furniture in the house. The man can do anything with her before the advent of Islam. The man can use his wife as a commodity to buy and sell or use as mortgage. The man had the right to tell his wife to go to the house of so and so and sleep with him. When he was a, a man from the elite of the society, so he can get a son from him. And once the husband died, the woman's or the wife's waiting period was a full year. During that, she was not allowed to touch water. She can't bathe. She was not allowed to clip her nails. She was not allowed to, to wear anything but the lowest and the filthiest type of clothes and live in the same type or description as a house. And she's not allowed to see anyone. That's slavery. Additionally, once that period ended, she became a property for the husband's family. They inherit her as if she's a bed or a couch or some type of Wealth the man owned and the ears inherit. Uglier than this is that if the man was married to more than one wife and he died, his eldest son from another wife was the one entitled to marry his father's ex-wife or widow rather. And... Uh, she could not say no, and if she wanted out, she had to bail herself out with money. But other cultures were not any better. See, in the ancient Greek and Roman culture, the Greeks used to consider the woman a pure evil from the devil. And them and the Romans considered her a commodity that the husband can sell anytime he wished. 
the Persians and the Romans had one thing in common, is that the husband had the right to sentence his wife to death. Chinese gave the husband the right to bury his wife alive, and she became an inheritance after his death for his family. The Indians were just another ugly example in this dark history. The wife was a slave who had no right to remain alive after the death of her husband, and she was to be burnt like he was burnt with him. But then, Allah Azza wa Jal sent rescue to humanity. Allah Azza wa Jal sent Islam. And with the advent of Islam, history changed. And the light of justice lit up the world. And wives regained their rights, restored their dignity, and their ranks were raised by Islam. Islam granted the wife many rights. Some are financial and some are non-financial rights. Amongst the rights, the financial rights, Islam gave the wife, number one, her right for a dowry. Allah says, وَآتُوا النِّسَاءَ صَدُقَاتِهِنَّ نِحْلًا and give women upon marriage their dowry gracefully. Once marriage happened, and that dowry is her right, no one has the right to marry her off without a dowry, not even her, her own father without her own consent. It is the right of the wife not her guardian. She is the only one who can say, I don't want it. And if the marriage is conducted without mentioning a certain amount, then the equal amount of those who are equal to her in social status is to be given to her. And it remains a debt on the husband until he pays it off or she denounces it. Once she's married, Islam obliges the husband to spend on his wife. And for the one who gets a newborn, the husband that is, is the duty of sustenance and clothing in an adequate manner according to his ability. The Prophet وسلم, said, and this is reported by Muslim narrated by Jabir radiallahu anhu. When addressing the issue of women's rights or wife's rights, he said, and they have right, the right upon you for you to provide for them food and clothing according to your ability. And to encourage men to do that and to endear this to their hearts, though it's an obligation, Allah Azza wa Jal allocated a great thing in return. You will be rewarded for feeding your wife, for clothing your wife, for treating your wife, for providing her a place to live. Though it's an obligation, yet you will be rewarded. In the books of Al-Imam Al-Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet وسلم, when talking about spending on one's family, he said even a bite, a bite, a single bite that you put in the mouth of your wife, you will be rewarded for. SubhanAllah. What a beautiful faith. What a just and fair legislation we have in Islam. Now things don't always go as people desire. And divorce can happen. 
Well, Islam governed that as well. The wife is entitled for food, drink, clothing, a place to live during her waiting period in a revocable marriage. And if she was pregnant, even if the marriage was irrevocable, she's entitled for all of that until she delivers. And once she delivers, if she gets custody, the baby's custody is paid for. Even if she suckles her own child, she has the right to ask for money in return. She's no longer a slave. She's no longer a piece of furniture. Islam raised her, gave her honor and dignity. Now, inheritance is yet another financial right the woman is entitled for. Just like Allah Azza wa Jal assigned a fixed amount for the husband in inheritance, he also, the Almighty, assigned a fixed amount for the wife in her husband's inheritance after his death. Islam gave women many rights and with regard to financial rights, even this is the case even if the woman is a wealthy woman. So no one would think, oh, this is because she's poor, she might not have, even if she is richer than the husband. These are rights. These are obligations upon the husband for his wife. If there is nothing to thank Allah Azza wa for, other than the fact that He made us Muslims, it would be enough. We thank Allah Azza wa for the mercy of making us Muslims. أقول ما تسمعون وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروا. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد Non-financial rights and recommended manner matters in Islam between the wife and the husband or actually upon the husband. Number one is to treat them kindly. As Allah says, bil ma'ruf." We'll live with them in kindness. Some men enter the house and the frown is something that can make you feel or get depressed as soon as you see it. It is as if he is going to launch a war in the house. They misunderstand the authority Allah gave the husband upon the wife or over the wife. And they go back in their behavior to the dark ages when men, when men enslaved women. Allah tells you and me not to do that. He tells us, to live with them in kindness, be merciful, be compassionate, be loving, be caring, smile when you see your wife. Bring joy to her heart. Don't make her feel that she's imprisoned. Teach her her faith is one of her rights to teach her her faith, to protect her hereafter, her akhira, to train her to do righteous deeds is one of her rights. Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. O you who have believed, protect yourselves and your families. A fire. 
The Prophet ﷺ said, and this is reported by Abu Hurayr, narrated by Abu Hurayrah, reported by Ibn Majah, classified as authentic by Al Albani. He said, May Allah have mercy on a man who wakes up in the middle of the night to pray tahajjud and then he wakes his wife up to pray with him. The Prophet ﷺ is doing two things here. Number one is supplicating for the one who does what he's instructing. Number two is instructing us to train our wives. Well, first we need to train ourselves to stand up for tahajjud. But once we do that, we need to be as caring and loving towards our wives. Islam forbade us to beat up women. I'm exposed to many cases, some of which the man goes into the house and he starts a, a fist fight with his wife as if he's having a street fight with some gang or something. Breaking bones, breaking teeth, bruising eyes. No, no, that has nothing to do with Islam. It has nothing to do with Islam. The Prophet ﷺ said, and this is in Al-Bukhari and Muslim, he said, how can one of you lash his wife, beat her up as if she's a slave, and then come at the end of the day and want to sleep with her? Yes, Islam permitted the man to discipline his wife. But there are stages. Number one, to admonish her, advise her. Number two, to abandon her. Now, abandoning the wife, the way you abandon your wife is another right. The Prophet ﷺ said, and this is reported by Abu Dawood, classified as authentic by Al Albani. He said, and he should not abandon his wife except in the same house. Don't leave the house and stay a month outside the house. And when Ibn Abbas was asked, he said he gives her his back in bed. Now, if this doesn't work, he hits her. Ibn Abbas explained what hitting here means. When he was asked, he said the use of the siwak, not a six-foot stick or a shoe or a belt or a fist. No, everything is governed by Islam. Our behavior should be because this is what Allah sent down. It's not up to me and you. And it's not up to your anger to decide what tool to use when disciplining your wife. She is not owned by you. She is your mate. She is the mother of your children. You did not take her from her parents' house to degrade her and humiliate her. You need to honor the wife. The Prophet ﷺ said, and this is reported by Ibn Majah, classified as authentic by Al Albani. He said, Khayrukum. The best amongst you are those who are best in treatment to their wives. And I am the best amongst you in treatment to my wife. People of knowledge said that this means this goodness in treatment means giving her all her rights. The Prophet ﷺ, unlike most of us, was always there whenever they wanted to speak to him and talk to him. Aisha radiallahu anha, 
And this is reported by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. Tells us a story of an incident when the Prophet ﷺ walked in. And she told him a story of 10 women who gathered. And they pledged to one another not to hold back any information about their households. And how their husbands treated them. And it was a long story of 10 women talking, each describing her case. And the Prophet ﷺ sat down, listening very attentively to his wife, Aisha, until she finished. And then after that, he comforted her. He said, I am like. Abu Zar to Um Zar. Abu Zar to Um Zar is Um Zar is one of the wives who spoke very highly of her husband and how he kindly treated her. He said, "I am to you like Abu Zar to Um Zar." Not only that, even when he was in i'tikaf, when he secluded himself for worship in the masjid during the last ten nights of Ramadan, Safiya comes to visit him in the masjid. And he would go and sit with her and talk to her and listen to her and then walk her back home in love and kindness and compassion. Life don't always go the way we want. Wives don't always act the way we want. It's a fact. Right? They have some qualities that are not so pleasing, right? But that's because they're human, right? And that has a, cu that has a cure from the Prophet ﷺ. He said, لا يفرك مؤمن مؤمنة Let not a believing man hate a believing woman. Talking about the man and his wife. If he dislikes, a quality in her, he certainly likes many other qualities. This is to tell me and you to remember at the time when the wife is disobedient or acts improperly in the house, reacts in a wrong way, to overlook. To ignore. See, it's not manly to always, oh, I'm the man of the house. I have to do this. You have to do this. You can't do this. You must do that. I'm. Yes, this is a fact. And it is our right as husbands. However, for life to go on smooth or smoother, we have to learn, we have to train ourselves how to overlook, how to ignore some behavior when it happens. How? By reminding ourselves with the good qualities our wives possess that are very pleasing to us. Islam raised women and the rank of women in all forms and in all positions, as mothers, as daughters, and as wives. Now the responsibility is upon me and you to put this into action and practice. Allahumma aghfir lana dhunubana wa israfana fi amrina. وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء